Yes. Oh, wait, no, no, I'm, I, we're done here. Is there anything you would like to see? I just wanted to see the code For which one? Work. For the work function. OK, sure. Code analyze. Sorry? Oh, just tsec common. Like if, if you look at the package object of that, it just has a bunch of syntax, like syntax objects here. To hex bytes, to ASCII string, this is where all this stuff lives. And there's a little joke where I called something Jerry Stringer because there are operations on string, but okay. I, that made me laugh and some people are using it, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. All right, let's go, let's, let's proceed because we have limited time. And we are running out faster than I can fathom, but I'm, I'm really happy with how you guys are responding and how you guys are enjoying the presentation. So, all right, okay, so let's talk about message authentication. Um, now, this is gonna be, now that you are primed on hash functions, it's not all that different. Um, you are trying to achieve integrity, but what message authentication it's essentially allows you to have, it's you can kind of think about, you have your own little secret parameter or you have your secret key that nothing, nobody else can forge from you. So in message authentication functions, you are able to, nobody is able to forge. I mean, in theory, you don't want anybody to be able to forge um, something that you got an authentication for, code from. Um, and I think, I think, mm, how can I say it? I think message authentication is almost, if not more important in the everyday world than, what's it called, than encryption. Um, how many of you have used a token? That's message authentication, right? Um, it's mostly not encryption. Um, the majority of you probably haven't even used encryption, maybe passively, maybe if you've used Amazon KMS or S3, um, then if you're working in the EU, now there's GPDR and a bunch of spam emails and you have to encrypt your data at rest. But you haven't actually touched it directly. But most of the time, if you write a web application, you have to deal with tokens. You have to deal with users. And that is why we care a lot about message authentication. And this, will come, this module will come very naturally to you guys because you're all professional developers and you've all most likely touched this, just not formally. But you have essentially talked about this. So as always, I'm going to get formal now. Um, message authentication, you can think about it as a, a three-tuple. Um, with gen, same thing about, um, we reused gen a lot, by the way, because we always need to generate keys because we're in the symmetric half, right? We're in the half of, of security that is symmetric. We're gonna get to asymmetric after this module. Um, but we're in the symmetric half and we have always gen and then we have Mac. And then I think my slides are cut off because there should be a verify here. Um, yes, they are. Okay, I got trolled, but, or I just messed up, but Regardless, it's a three tuple gen Mac and verify. It's okay, you can see verify here. Um, gen, same thing. And by the way, it has a security parameter. This is implicit. Just in, in general, our security parameter is implicit, and most of the time, we just mean key length. Um, probably, like, formally, mathematically, it's a little bit different. Um, in practice, it's almost always key length or length of tag. Yes? Um, what's the difference between asymmetric and asymmetric? We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. You're getting excited. Um, so essentially Mac, except the message M, similar to a hash function, except it takes a key now. Um, so Max is, is a K with an M and it gives you a T. This time, I mean, I'm, because I've done the zero one notation, I'm pretty sure you guys are know that this is a binary string by now. Um, so it's gonna take a key and an M and it's gonna give you a tag and tag, and that tag is not encryption. It's very similar to a hash. As a matter of fact, what's it called, um, message authentication functions are made from hashes, some are. Um, but in general, this is public. You can find out what this is. What isn't public is your key. The key's private, only you have it. Or if you gave it to your friend at a specific secret meeting, he has it too. But in general, um, only you have it. And then we have a verify function, which accepts the message and the key and the tag and it gives you a Boolean. Uh, usually in formal, in formal notation, that just means a zero or a one, but um, it takes the three. So, so now you don't, you don't only need the key and the message, you also need the tag. Because what are we checking? We are checking that this key with this message produces the same tag, right? If it doesn't produce the same tag, somebody tampered with it. Yes? Can you give an example of where Verify isn't just doing equality on the result of Mac? Where it's not? 
No, it, it is it is always doing that. That's exactly what's happening. So, so there's no example of it not doing that. Not doing it. Doing so it, it, it so yeah, so you so what yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You apply Mac on these two again and then you check this. So yeah, you check this. The only the only thing you have to make sure of is I guess um, you have to use constant time byte equality when you do this because you can leak information that way if it's not. So you essentially constant time byte equality just means of course, if you have two vectors of bytes, you just check every single one, even if you figured out that they're not the same before. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a really simple thing to do, but, um, sorry? Yeah, hopefully, please Scala, but, yeah, so actually you, you, you have it right. So that's, so I guess I don't have to go um, into it too deep. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's just a tag and we verify the tag. Um, and we usually want Max to, you know, obviously do arbitrarily long inputs. So there's, you know, just signing cookies. Um, sorry, the, there's just adding a tag to cookies or adding a tag to a JWT. They're different lengths usually. And we want to be able to handle both of them. But there are fixed Max functions. Um, and I think that's how they were tackled historically first. But again, in, in theory, it's not useful. Um, or it might be for that one obscure researcher. But now let's actually reuse it. So this is, this is we're, we're coming back to how nicely cryptography just, it composes, like it composes very similar to types um, where we can reuse a construct that we defined before. So now we can use Mac as a PRF, pseudo random function in a sense. And what can we apply on pseudo random functions? We can apply modes of operation. So CPC Mac is the same thing as if you were encrypting, except you ignore the intermediate outputs. So if you guys remember CBC, I'm, I'm gonna not spend a lot of time on this because again, CBC Mac is not how people do it now. So the, like, don't, don't, don't bother asking questions about this part because it's not, you're never gonna use CBC Mac now. Um, but it, it's useful to talk about it because in a sense, it kind of shows how it went naturally from a, from a sort of definition of how I, we want to scramble inputs. So CBC Mac is the same thing. We take our I, we take our message, we XOR them here. We put them through to our, now th we're not gonna call this a function, but we're gonna call this a PRF because it doesn't necessarily have to be an encryption function, though it usually is, uh, a PRF of K. So a pseudo random function that is keyed, a keyed pseudo random function, and that is gonna give us RC1, right? Let's say, let's, let's say this was ciphertex one, but actually let's say that we have more messages. We actually don't care about this at all. We only care about this for the sake of feeding it to the input of our next one, which is how CBC mode works. XOR, M1 and repeat. And then all you do is that, remember, if you guys remember at the end, just the, the final guy standing, that's the one that we use as our attack. That's it. And you can think about it pretty easily as like you are just encrypting and just keeping the last little bit and you're keeping the, the block. And then I guess the nice, the nice part about max, so by the way, max can be variable length too, but we usually care about fixed length just because we don't necessarily want to double, like it's a similar situation to a one time pad. We don't want to have an n bit long message and an n bit long tag. It's just a lot of memory. And if we can, you know, if, if we don't necessarily have collisions, then most likely we're not going to forge the Mac. So, CBC Mac, again, this is what I said, split message into the thing, and I have a really funky uh, bracket here. Whoopsie. And I have a really funky bracket here, um, but we split it into little chunks. Maybe you need to pad him. Then the first one for Mac, by the way, is the, we, you don't use random IVs for Mac. You just use zero to the N. So like, I mean, not to the power of N, like an N bit long zeroed out string. So just literally, if you're using it long, it's just a zero um, of N bits. And then for i to l over n, which is basically the, the, the divisible, you know, the, how many blocks there actually are, you simply take the function and you do t1 x or m. And then again, you assign it. This is, this is uh, mutable, so this is clearly, uh, actually this is not mutable because it's calling it ti. And then you just return the last one tln. But again, this is just nice how, how it's sort of CBC Mac came naturally. But in general, actually, like the, the, the main, I guess, issue, one of the issues is that it's obviously invertible. Um, so it's not as secure as uh, using a hash function because 
Um, of course, you can map. I mean, with CBC map, you are using a pseudorandom function that is not a compression function. So it's not what's it called? It's not um, it's not a one-way function. If they exist, I will talk about that. But it's not a one-way function, so it's not going to be as hard. I have a question. Yes. Could verify always just be map plus a quality check, or would also be a list of table? Like, what else would you verify be? Yeah, no, it's just it's ma it's Mac and a quality check. Okay, I've always been. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. For example, but but message usually you don't. Um, we call asymmetric Macs. We call them digital signatures. We will we will talk about why. Um, this is the one that you care about. This is and this is the it's a super simple construction by the way. This is the this is what you all use if you use a JW tier or Java however you want to call it. You're using this, and this is a simple construction. So I'm going to go through it. It's simply, OPAD is, by the way, is just a fixed length. It's, it's something like, I think it's 0x, 5c, 5c, 5c. It's a, it's a fixed length. It's as long as the key. And then you XOR that. So, so you, OPAD and um, the key are XOR. And then you concatenate it with the result of the hash of key with a different padding concatenated with the message. Now, this might look a little bit confusing at first, why there's two pads, right? Um, and it's actually a very interesting property. And it's that, so we already know that hashes are one-way functions. But again, we want the property of avoiding collisions. So what if our hash function does have collisions, right? Um, which has happened. MD2, MD5, they're all broken now. And people were using MD5. <laughs> Equifax clearly was. Um, so what do you do? Um, well, HMAC is a little interesting in that HMAC made these paddings as a sort of way of deriving a different key. Why? Because if you think about it, right, this key is your randomness, your IV, your whatever, but you know your key. The only reason I'm not calling it a nonce is because you need to use that key multiple times. So it's a key. Yeah, of course. But I mean, that's why I, I, I kind of want, kind of want to say that it's randomness, but it's not a, a random value. It's a fixed value that you obtained randomly. It's really confusing. Um, but key XOR OPAD and then key XOR IPAD give you two different keys. It's, just, it's a kind of a key derivation. And then you hash the input of, of the, of the right-hand side. Of course, this, this is an inner function, so this is guess hash first. And then you concatenate it with this XOR, and then you hash it again. And what, what's nice about this is that it adds more randomness to where if the hash function itself is weak collision resistance. So eventually you will find a collision and it's not that hard. Um, then HMAC itself is actually safe because it has, because finding, like generating a collision in HMAC is not the same. It does not undergo the same construction as the attacks such as meet in the middle for, um, I'm not gonna get into hash attacks because they're really, really, really involved, but um, except for the MD5 ones, but we don't have time. Um, but this makes it essentially safe somewhat to collisions. Um, this adds some, you can, you can consider it like randomness, but in a sense, it's kind of like having a two-stage key that you derived off of your first key. And it's nice, and why is this nice? Because actually, so you guys, I mentioned MD5, and MD5 is this really old algorithm now. Um, when MD5 was broken, everyone using HMAC MD5 did not have to immediately switch. Because MD5 was broken, but HMAC MD5 was not. So it gave developers time to you know, move their infrastructure and switch to SHA-1, which is now broken too. Not, the, not, not in an easy way though, not, not in like a trivial way like MD5 is, but it is broken as well now. And this construction of HMAC allows us to do this, to, to be a little bit more, more safe. Now, um, I wanna do a little quip on authenticated encryption, although I will not go into a practical example of it. Um, for authenticated encryption, it's, we talked about how encryption does not um, ensure integrity, and that's because encryption, also certain ciphers have something called malleability, where you can alter bits and still have a, vi like a, a valid ciphertext that looks like something. It's hard to do, but this is w why certain, certain ciphers are malleable in that sense, that you can alter bits, not necessarily like random bits every time, but because it's not integrity checked, then, like in a sense, because nobody's checking that this is the actual right cipher. If you decrypt the cipher text that's altered, you're gonna get, you are gonna always get a valid one, but it might not be what you want. But you don't know. I mean, you don't know if, if it was tampered with or not. So, 
what we actually do use and what we use in TLS, so this is actually one of the most important parts in regards to encryption. Um, it just took a lot of building up to, is what we use in TLS is authenticated encryption. So when, so I'm gonna give a super one minute overview of TLS because it's actually super complicated. Like it said, only a few people actually know the TLS implementation really, really like off by heart. But essentially you have a machine one I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a big M because I keep using really bad symbols. I'm gonna call it machine one and we have machine two. And we do use asymmetric encryption here and we will talk about it eventually. But let's say that, that there's a way for these two to exchange a key, right? So they both establish a, a shared key and I will talk about why soon. Um, and I'll try to blaze through it because of time. But if these two have a shared key, then what happens is that we, they want to send messages to each other, encrypted messages, and this is how your HTTPS works. But you, again, we are trying to integrity check because we want packets that come from a different server or a different client to be checked. Like they, we, you don't want somebody forging your transactions or somebody being able to manipulate them um, at, the, you know, at, the, at the packet level. So we have to integrity check our encryptions. So not only do we have to hide, let's say, our password when we send it, but we also have to essentially check that it wasn't altered, right? So this is kind of how TLS does. It does algorithm negotiation, and then it does, it shares a key, and then this is only a session key, it eventually changes, blah, 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 blah. It's super long, not getting into it. I just want to, want to make it very clear that authenticated encryption is super important, um, especially for just the backbone of our internet. Um, and there's essentially three, three, um, three ways that people do it. You do encrypt and Mac. So you, you guys already got Mac. You guys already know encryption. So encrypt and Mac is the best one currently. And I'll explain why. So we have some E sub K, well, sorry, some encryption function. So we get the ciphertext here. So we take the plain text here. We get the ciphertext here. And then we apply our Mac, Mac. We apply Mac on the ciphertext. So why is this the best one? Because this is going to integrity check our plain text and our ciphertext. Um, I guess bad bad part is obviously it has to be sequential. So you do need the ciphertext before you are, have the plain text. Sorry, before you have the Mac. Um, but this, uh, this ensures both have integrity. So your ciphertext can't be altered because your plain text can be altered because they're both checked by the Mac. There's also encrypt and Mac which means, which is essentially uh, you Mac the plain text and then you encrypt. Again, it's just inferior because it doesn't integrity check your ciphertext. Um, and Mac and then encrypt, which is, sorry, I think I got it backwards. Um, one encrypts like only the, 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 oh yeah, sorry. Mac and then encrypt, it only encrypt the plain text. Sorry, only Max the plain text. And it's just terrible, don't even get into it. I don't want to get into that. Um, um, so encrypt and Mac. So encrypt, encrypt, encrypt then Mac or encrypt and Mac? Okay. So, um, God, I forgot. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, so Mac then encrypt is clearly that you apply the Mac function on the, the plain text. So the server text is not integrity protected. And encrypt the Mac is slightly different construction. I think it's, I forgot. I am sorry. I forgot this part. I just can tell you it's bad. <laughs> what, did I have it in my notes? No, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot this one. It escapes me. That is embarrassing, but I'm sorry. Yeah, this is, I'll, I can look it up for you. I'm cheating. This is on Wikipedia, by the way. So authenticated encryption. So sorry, here it is. So okay, here it is. So Mac, and then so this is encrypted Mac, is we're encrypting the ciphertext. So this is the one that we want. Uh, encrypt and a Mac is that we encrypt this, and then we essentially use a we encrypt the, we what's it called? We only Mac the plain text, and then what's it called? This one is essentially. Oh yeah. So actually, these are these two are very very similar, um, but you essentially encrypt the the you encrypt the plain text with the Mac. Sorry. So that's the main the main difference. I had forgotten. Mac and then encrypt just means that 
you are encrypting this whole block. So encrypt and Mac just means that you only Mac the plain text and not, what's it called, and not the, the, the ciphertext at all. So encrypt and Mac only gives you, encrypt and Mac only gives you, um, what's it called, uh, integrity for the plain text. This gives you sort of, not really like integrity for the ciphertext, but at least if you were to change the Mac, you would not get the same ciphertext. So. Um, but in general, these constructions aren't used. Uh, this, this was actually, I did something. Um, this for the encrypt and, did I? Oh, no, okay, it's fine. Um, so one, this one actually ended up in padding Oracle. <laughs> so, because essentially this, this, is, this makes it hard to detect errors. So in general, this is the best one, but I guess it's the slowest because it's hard to parallelize. Okay, let's, uh, okay. So this is gonna be another exercise. Uh, and this one is gonna be super, super simple. This is like the simplest thing. And I guess I made it probably way too easy. But um, so this one, we're gonna literally just blaze through it um, here. So this is, this, we're using a bunch of teaser classes because or else I would have to write the exact same thing. So we're gonna talk about what JWTs are and they're super simple construct. They're just a standardized Mac. That's the easiest way I can give it to you. It's a, it's a Mac, like we're, we're, we're Macing a, what's it called? We are applying a, Mac fun, a message authentication function on a known structure, that's it. So what does JWT have? It's essentially like two JSONs. So we have, uh, what's it called? We have something that says algorithm, it says like let's say HMAC SHA-256, so this is one, and this has other parameters as well. Um, this is the header. So this is the, what you call the header. Then we have the claims. So the claims, I'm gonna show it in Scala, which is gonna be easier to actually show you what it means. So, because I actually added documentation to this because this is my library. And if you look at what the, the claims are, you have something called an issuer which is essentially the person that issued the thing. Uh, a subject, um, which you know, it's just a, a case sensitive string. Audience, uh, expiration, not before. So the, the ones, I, can, the, I think the main ones are expiration, not before and issued at, which means issued at gives you a date when you actually created the token. Not before says, if you try to accept this token before this date, fail. That's not, that should not pass. And then the last one is, um, what's it called? Yeah, expiration, which is of course expiration. After this date, like this, this authentication thing should not pass. So this is actually Mac and thing. And what what, what happens is, for for JWT or JWT or whatever, let's say these are the claims, because you know there's a lot of them. And by the way, they're optional, so they're not even always going to be there. You can have empty claims. Yeah, you can you you can have arbitrary claims. Yes, you can have arbitrary claims. Um, it's not just those fixed ones, but the, the, the headers are fixed. I mean, I no, actually, you can add stuff to the headers, but why would you? <laughs> well, there's the claims. Um, and they're both just mapped. So what happens is that you take this, and I think you get the, the I think it's the UT, so you, I think you get the UTF-8 bytes of this, and then you turn those bytes into base64 URL string. You do this for the same thing, and then you concatenate them with a dot. And then after you concatenate them with a dot, then you take the whole thing of this, and then you get the ASCII bytes. So it's just a bunch of encoding, and then on the ASCII bytes, you get the MAC. And that's it, that's all JWT is. Um, of course, there are asymmetric JWTs, but I'm not, we're not there yet. Yes? Uh, so you're saying you take the base 64 and interpret it as ASCII, and using so let, 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 let's go in sequence because I went through it too fast. I just think, I just think we don't have to get too bogged down in, in encodings. But you know, we have some string. I have some string S, right? Then we apply you know, base. First we apply, I think it's, we apply UTF-8. Eight, which is gonna, take, it's gonna take your, what's it called, your string. And it's gonna give you a byte string. And then we're going to apply two base64. So let's say, um, uh, what's it called? Two UTF-8. Then, two, and this should be two UTF-8 bytes. Bytes. This, is, this one's going to be um, two B64 
URL safe string, string. And this is going to take your byte string, byte string, and this gives you another string back. Why? Because, so we, we kind of just scramble it with the encodings, and then we concatenate them with a dot. That's literally it. So we take, so now we, remember, we apply string to byte string and byte string to string again. So we have a string, so we have two strings, and now we do like S concatenated with S1 concatenated. Let's just say this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be nice and say this is gonna be headers. Header string, then uh, dot, and this is gonna be, uh, What's it called? This is going to be um, the claim string. String. There we go. Here we go. So header string dot claim string, and then now this is a string again. Mm -hmm. Then we take this whole thing, and then we take ASCII bytes, and then not no, not UTF-8 ASCII. And then on ASCII we get the MAC. That's it. We apply the MAC function, and then we get it. And then we take that MAC function, we put that in base 64 URL. <laughs> And then we return that. So it looks, yeah. So I'll, I'll show you how it looks like. Um, I wish I could navigate nicely, but I'm not. I have to do this like a pleb. I just think I just think all my keybinds are messed up because I use idea of him. Okay, but well that's fine. Um, also, my keybinds are different than my home computer. So that makes it even more confusing. So I'll show you what a JWT looks like. This one is a super simple one. All I did is we have a subset of JWT. So the only reason I made it a subset is because let, let's say we're only doing JWTs for HMAC SHA-256, right? Because um, there's a lot, there's about six algorithms currently. Um, and that's only for JWSs. I'm, <laughs> I don't even want to get into this. But for let, let's consider JWTs as just the one with six algorithms on what I just told you about. Um, and then this is what I said. So we take base64 URL of this thing, and then, yeah. Um, so by the way, this two base64 URL, look at what it does. It says serialize to UTF-8, and then encode base64 URL. You see this? So this is literally what I, what I said earlier. Um, I'm gonna, I want to place through this, because I, I think this might be a little bit boring. Um, but all, all, I'm, all I did in this exercise is I literally just wanted you to apply, to learn how to apply a Mac function in Scala. That's it. Um, because this part, I made it for you already here. So this is the concatenation, right? And then over here, um, I did the concatenation, and then I think I got the ASCII, the ASCII, uh, the ASCII bytes. It says to sign, so calculate to sign. So the, what we were supposed to do is that I gave you the string, and we were, I was supposed to calculate it, and we were supposed to, and I was supposed to give you an HMAC SHA string back. And what it actually is is simple. We're gonna take HMAC SHA of 256, when I sign of ID, or sorry, IO. So we're going to sign it with, so our in bytes are our to sign. And we're going to get the ASCII bytes of this. And then it's just going to take our key. And that is it. That is all this exercise was. And what this little program does here is that this is an IO, by the way, because this is a pseudo-random generator. Again, it has state. So we generate a key. We get the instant. So we have to check the clock time. So clearly, it's, a, it's not referentially transparent. Um, we create a little subset, and then we call our check function. And then we check whether the expiration. So basically, I wrote a JWT, if you can call it a parser, but not really. Um, I, a JWT like serializer and deserializer on TSEC. So that one has been tested. So I'm checking whether our call is correct by double checking whether the expiration was the same as the one that TSEC parsed. So I turned this whole thing into a string. And then after turning it into a string, then I am checking whether the instant equals the other instant. That's it. So if you see, I run subsect that checked. So I do, uh, this is going to give me parse.body, let's see. Yeah, so you see it, it, it runs. So after I create the Mac here, I run it through this thing called verify and parse, where I append it in the, in the little dot format. And I check the TSEC parser. And if it works, it, it's good. And this is going to be, it's just probably going to return true immediately, because there's not anything interesting here. 
if it does, it's going to be so sad. It probably will have to do with reference equality, but... Okay. So, this is going to be Mac exercises, I think. Run. All we need to do is call the Mac function. And it's just literally going to print the result. <laughs> it's false. Okay, it probably has to do with reference equality, to be honest with you. So let's 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 check where it's. Uh, yeah, so this would have thrown an error. So I think another way of checking this is I'm not even going to bother. Um, let me see why it's this way. So B64 URL. Did I get the ASCII bytes of this thing? Yeah, it should have been fine. So it, if if it's because of this, then if it's not. Don't try this at home. This is not referentially transparent. Well, can I just print the expiration to epoch noi and parsed? To epoch noi. Let's call it epoch. Wait, parsed. Oh, no, yeah, we're just going to print it. Technically, it should be the same. Uh, so, sorry, I wrote print and not print line. And I ran the run. <laughs> I ran the server of the previous question. Okay, so let's parse dot body dot. Uh, I think this is expiration. That don't do this. No, did it again. I want to just call um, the Mac exercises run, and then that should be it. But I don't want to spend too much time on this because again, this is literally just I wanted to show you how you call a function. Uh, I should have parsed it properly. And if it did parse it properly, then it was correct. It's if I'm not getting it correct, it's probably just yeah. There's for some reason I think it's uh, it might be updating the time probably. Um, but so oh, sorry. A higher level conceptual question. So yeah, to, to do this, basically both sides need to have the the, C, the key, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, right. you, usually. It's a private key. Yeah, it's a private key. So usually, the, the nice part about this is that this usually usually is not a two two person thing. Um, it's like, for example, if you're issuing an authentication token. Yeah. So if you issue an authentication token uh, and you give it to a user, and they are in your web app, if it's a token, it could be a session cookie. They're in your web app, and then they need to send in a request. How do you check that they're authenticated? They don't need to have the key, but you definitely have it. So you signed that token, and then you can verify it yourself. So you don't that key doesn't need to escape where you are. And that's the practical implementation of it. Um, I, I think there's also a thing with digital signatures are, but sort of a concept where somebody has a private key. And yeah, that's a, key so let, let's move on. I don't really care that this is not running, to be honest. I think I, think I got the, the point across. Um, it probably has to do with, with essentially, what's it called? The, something related to, to how something is impure. I don't know. I, I'll check it over and probably fix it tonight. But this is, uh, we were mostly worried about it conceptually. Um, Technically, I mean, it did, it did parse. So for some reason, we're getting a different expiration. But um, the nice part is that clearly we calculated the math correctly because it parsed the, J, the, J, the, J, the, J, the JOT or the JWT. So it, um, it did that. So that's, 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 a good point. Like, that's a good point. And now let's move on. OK. So sorry that the, that the demo gods are not with me today. but. Um, this is way more important because this is going to be probably uh, mathematically the hardest part. And uh, how long do we even have? We have an hour and a half. Does it end at four or five? Okay. Okay. So two hours. It's good. Okay. So that that might be enough. We might get to elliptic curves, which is great. All right. But. This is going to be the not fun part. And we are not going to do any programming for. Yeah, 
Okay, awesome. That's great. But I mean, I, th I thought you guys wanted exercises. This is not exercises. This is just going to be purely mathematics. Um, and I am 100% sure all of you, maybe one of you, but most likely, you know, like if you're a beginner functional programmer, then you don't know this. But 99% sure all of you know what a monoid is. So um, we're going to only recap it really quickly because, again, the whole theme of this thing is from the ground up. But... Let's go back to number theory. So at the most basic level, it's the study of integers. Um, relationship of integers, primes, divisibility, etc. So let's start with divisibility. Um, this part you might not remember um, because this is not necessarily always tied to functional programming, but it's very, very important in cryptography. So simply divisibility is that we let A and B be some non-zero integers, or sorry, b, b, b only, only b needs to be non-zero because we cannot divide by zero, we know that's undefined. So we can say b divides a, and I am gonna use this notation a lot because it's basically the most important and because I don't have to write divides a billion times. But we say b divides a, or b pipe a, if essentially we can rewrite a in terms of b and some quotient. So that means this essentially implies that A is equal to some QB, some quotient B. That quotient is unique. We're not going to get into the proof of that. This is the visibility. And then it has some properties. Of course, that means that it's essentially transitive. So if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. Would you guys like a proof of that? Or no? Are you guys good? OK, cool. All right, so then if B divides A and A divides B, then that means A and B are equal uh, in some way. And then if A divides B and A divides C, that means A divides B plus C and A divides B minus C. Um, these are all, you want to proof it? It is a quick proof. Yeah. So, it's, so a lot of these things, and a lot of the reason cryptography is very, very accessible is because these proofs require elementary grade mathematics. Um, so we're going to say A divides B. B means that A is equal to QB, right? And then we know that A divides C. Sorry, sorry, other, that's the other way around. Oh, no, no, let's do it this way. We just got to flip it. I, I did it the idiot way. Um, QA, because A is the divisor. So, so that means B is in terms of A. And then we have B divides C is equal to, essentially, C is equal to some, this is Q, so let's say this is R A. Oh, sorry, ah, A divides C. So this is R A. So now let's do what is B plus C. This is really, really funny. Where is B plus C? Now let's, let's rewrite it in terms of this thing. So B plus C, we have, um, plug it in, QA plus RA. Let's group them together. Q plus R times A. This is clearly some integer quotient. Therefore, that's the proof. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Super simple mathematics. Absolutely. Really powerful, as you will see later. Um, now, what we, this is by the, basically, by the way, lightning number theory. Because I would love, 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 love to get to elliptic curves before we run out of time. That means a lot of things, um, hopefully, do your best to, to, to answer the question in your head because there's a lot of stuff to go and cover. Um, not that I want to dissuade you for answering questions, but we, there's really a lot of stuff. Um, so we're going to call GCD AB the greatest common divisor of some integers A and B, uh, with obviously none of them being zero. Um, so the GCD is, as the name implies. So remember, one number can have multiple divisors, and like a pair of numbers can have multiple divisors. So if we're thinking, you know, uh, nine and twelve, they are both divisible by three. Um, in that case, actually, three is the GCD. But um, you know, if if we make this higher, we're gonna have like, for example, something that's divisible by by three can also be divisible by nine in certain situations. GCD is just the highest one, and then. Um, well, let's call now. Let's let's uh, go a little bit more flexible in divisibility because we define divisibility in terms of a only b, a divides b, but we did not define division. Why didn't we define division? Because in a sense, 
if we did it in the, you know, in the B pipe A, if B does not divide A, then this is undefined. Actually, and, and the, no, the math notation for that is that you literally just cross out the little pipe. So if B does not divide A, that's this nice little pipe. So that means B does not divide A. And division with remainder is simply the concept of what we did before, but now we may or may not have a little remainder left in our division. So that means, you know, so B divided by A, like we, we could say B divided by A. We don't actually use this notation a lot, but we can, we, can say, we can say that this is essentially equivalent to, this is not equivalent, but this is equivalent to essentially, um, so B divided by A, we have A, Q times A plus some remainder R. And if R is zero, of course, that means A divides B, right? Um, but I only showed this for the sake of it. I'm really only gonna use pipe notation from now on. So if, this, if R is equal to zero, this is true. And if it's not, then it's not true. This is simple. And now essentially, you know, that's what I said. Now let's talk about the Euclidean algorithm. Um, we want to be able to get the greatest common divisor of two numbers. And I'm gonna do a really, really quick derivation of the Euclidean algorithm. Um, kind of why it arises. So essentially, let's say we, we are having, we don't know these two numbers. Or sorry, we, we do, but we don't know the greatest common divisor of some A and B, right? And let's say that B like this is not necessarily, this is gonna give us a division with a remainder, but they do have a greatest common divisor, right? So let's say that this gives us the GCD of AB. Now remember, the one thing I need to note about GCD is that it's defined in terms of, usually it's A divided by B, and the largest one is just flipped. So the largest one is always gonna be on the left-hand side most of the time. Um, that's just the, the definition, because obviously you can't, you know, you can't divide a small number by a larger number, that doesn't make sense. Um, so but largest on the right or the left. left. I mean, I guess it doesn't matter, but but like it matters in the sense that I want to when I make the equivalence function, then it's going to not make sense. So in this sense, we can say that a divided by b is b plus wait sorry b times q plus r. Now, if r is some remainder, then we we know like let's say that we have a greatest common divisor that exists. Now remember that. We talked about property three, where if A divides C, A divides B, then A divides B plus C, right? Then if the greatest common divisor exists, then it must divide these two terms as well. So now we can actually run this recursively, actually. So now we do this. We do the, the, the next step of this is just running GCD of B. Then we run it all the way until we get zero. So I will show you the Euclidean algorithm right now. And, I, and it's really easy. Just give me two numbers. Anyone, two numbers. 15 and 7. Okay. 15 and 7. This one's going to be a really quick one. Okay. So we have 15 is equal to 7 times 2 plus 1. Right? Um, then we have seven is equal to essentially one times seven plus zero. Okay, so they don't have a, the greatest common divisor is one. When the remainder is zero is one. And then obviously this is not always gonna be zero. Like I'm saying like the, sorry, this is not always gonna be one. And actually- The remainder of which operation is zero? The remainder of the last operation. So- And how do you chain together the recursive part? I'll, I'll show you in a second. I'm just rewriting this again. You run GCD on the remainder and the first quotient that you ran. And actually the remainder is always, it's actually a, a, a proof, you can actually make a proof, but that one's a longer one, that the remainder is always gonna be smaller than this. You're, you're never gonna, because I mean, actually that's a super simple proof. If, if, if you could have a remainder larger than this, then that means it would, they would, you could add another, you could just increment the, the quotient and then the remainder would be smaller. So that, that, that one is a very trivial proof, but. Um, yeah. I think the way to describe it is the GCD of, let's say two numbers A and B, the 
GCD of A and B is the same as the GCD of B and R, or R is the remainder of the first step? But that, yeah, but that's only if, if, if it didn't terminate in the first step. I want to I make it clear that sometimes they do terminate in the first, the first step, right? right? Um, so essentially, um, there is a nice construction in that the, there's a, something called the Eucl extended Euclidean algorithm. So this was the Euclidean algorithm. The extended Euclidean algorithm tells us, and sorry, we are like blazing through this, but this means that G, the extended Euclidean algorithm, I think it's more of a law than it is essentially just a, an equation. But this means that any G, GCD, I mean, you can rewrite GCD of A and B always in this form. This is always inhabited. GCD of this looks disgusting, but there we go. So this equation always has a solution. And then there's a really nice property in all, basically all of uh, public key cryptography. Let's say it's dependent on this, not really, but when the GCD of A and B are one, that means two numbers are relatively prime or co-prime. And they have, it has a super really, like a really, really interesting property. Now, let's go to modular arithmetic. And, and, and it's good if you jot this down mentally or just follow along with the slides. But we're going to be hopping around in a bunch of places because we need to, the, essentially how you set up for asymmetric cryptography is I need to give you a bunch of background first in number theory and abstract algebra, and then we can actually use it. So if it seems like I'm hopping around, there's a reason why I'm hopping around. Um, so modular arithmetic, it just essentially, um, the easiest way to think about it is imagine your division with remainder, then your remainder is on the other side of the modulus. So let's say that, you know, um, that the A, you know, A over B is, you know, B times Q plus R, right? This is another way of saying that is that, a is congruent to, this is by the way, in logic you see this as essentially like equality, sometimes like, like Boolean equality um, or preposition equality, how, however you want to call it. Um, in this case, it's called congruence. This means that this is kind of equal, it's equal to R modulo B or R mod B. This is the remainder, of course, it's the same thing. So really easy and simple, powerful concept. Um, but yeah, again, A divided by B, same thing. You can just rewrite it. Now, the, the reason why you rewrite it is, I guess, you just get rid of this Q. You don't, you don't really care about it um, in this case. But that's essentially the, the basics of modular arithmetic. And then, you know, the, it has some really simple rules. If A1 is equal to, let, so I'll just walk through these ones really quickly. Essentially, um, the, the easiest way of staying it, like stating it in, in layman's terms is that if it holds outside of like modular arithmetic, it holds inside of it. So what for, for these proofs, I mean, it would be, this, it would be essentially the same proof as you would if you did re division with remainder. Um, okay. You could, but it, like, it's essentially, how can I say it's like, like the thing is that if you did it over, the, like the remainder, it's essentially you're in, you're ignoring the Q, right? You're in, you're ignoring the quotient. So it's essentially if you add a a one and b one, or even if you subtract them, the like the quotient is essentially going to go away no matter what because of distributivity, right? So um, it's it's just a very simple thing that you can just assume that anything like if addition addition holds outside of modular arithmetic, then it holds inside of it as well. So if I were to take the modulus of A and the modulus of B, and then I add them together, it's the same thing as adding them outside of the modulus and then taking the modulus. Um, if I, I could literally just do a proof in terms of this, and I think you could even do it yourself if you have a pen and paper, but it's actually a really simple thing to prove. Um, but I wanna go through because really, I really wanna get to elliptic curves. And again, now here's the nice thing about when I was talking about co-prime numbers. Co-prime numbers, have an inverse. What does this mean? That in modular arithmetic, two numbers, well, a, a number that is co-prime with the modulo, we call m the modulo, by the way. So when I say this is something modulo m, the, sorry, modulus, the modulus is m. So 
if GCD of A and M is 1, that means there exists a B that is the inverse of A. And multiply those, you get 1. And by the way, I'm talking about the integers. I'm talking about the integers. We will get algebraic very soon. So, so you know, hold on to your seats. <laughs> but we, we, we will get into the abstract algebra part very soon. And we are in the next slide. Groups, rings, and fields. And I'm sure most of you have seen this. But usually, majority of you have seen monoids, because monoids are the ones that appear in programming all the time. Um, in cryptography, we need stronger notions of them. So essentially, monoids don't have an inverse law. They, ha they are associative, and they have an empty element. Um, they are not necessarily commutative. Uh, commutative, if, if the operations are commutative, they are commutative monoids. It's not the same as a monoid. But a group is kind of like a super monoid. So it has the identity element. And by the way, this little exclamation marks it means there exists a unique epsilon. So this, this, this is just because this is really easy to write. So there exists a unique epsilon in a group G. So remember, a group is literally just a set and a rule, which essentially the rule is our binary operator. Again, that's the, that's the M append on monoid. Um, but, but this is more general, of course. So the rule is the little star is how we combine two elements. And our laws are identity. That means that there exists a unique identity law, uh, identity element where you know it's essentially commutative with respect to A and appending the identity element or combining rather using the operator on any non-empty element with the empty element just going to give you the same element. Um, we have associative law. You guys know associativity, so you know if you shift the brackets, it's the same thing. And we have an inverse law for a group. So now it's a little bit strong. It's not. It's a lot stronger than a monoid, where every element now has an inverse. So that means every element is invertible, and you can take every two elements, and when you combine the two elements, now instead of calling it B, we're going to calling it A to the negative one, which that means A inverse. So A binary operator A inverse is going to give you the empty element. And that's the same star as the one in the previous. Yes. Oh, sorry. No worries. My bad. It is the same star. It, is, uh, it was a test. Um, so now let's go to rings. Ring is a group, essentially two groups. Well, no, it's a, it's a group and a community of honor, essentially. But, um, a ring is essentially now, instead of just having one operator, which what you're used to monoids, you have two. And you have addition, and then you have multiplication. Not necessarily integer addition and multiplication, by the way. There are polynomial rings where it's different. So remember, we are in abstract algebra. So these operators are called addition and multiplication, but they're not always integer addition and multiplication. And, and sorry? Addition and multiplication yes. in relation to each other is still the same as they would be in? We're getting on that now. Okay. So um, because. So remember, a group is not necessarily commutative. When a group is commutative, you have an abelian or commutative group. Um, so a ring forms an abelian group under plus, under addition. And it forms a commutative monoid under multiplication. Sorry, um, my bad. It forms just a monoid under multiplication. So you guys are aware of monoids. Um, so I did not write the laws out one by one because you guys are functional programmers and you're awesome in abstract algebra. So the main difference, I guess, between just a group is that now we have a distributive law, which is what you were talking about. And it works in the same way you would think it does. So when you've done algebra when you were a kid, you, you, know, you spread out the multiplication, it works the same way. So you have left distributivity and right distributivity. It works the same way. And of course, if star is commutative, then you have a commutative ring. And then we get to the most awesome construct that beats out the monoid for me, because it's cryptography, and that's what we're talking about. And we have fields. And if we augment the multiplication with an inverse, so that means we add an inverse law, or we have a ring that satisfies an inverse law, now we have a field. And this is the cool part. So fields now are, can, be, or can be finite and infinite. But we care about finite fields, because in cryptography, we deal with finite inputs. And a lot of the times, we operate on like bound numbers. Like when we're operating on ciphers, we operate on blocks. Um, 
having essentially a notion of something being finite is something that we're very good at in cryptography. So now, one thing that's sort of tangential, but it comes in handy later, is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So this is, this is a really simple one. It just means every single integer, so you can make every single integer uh, greater than or equal to two, because two is a prime. Um, you can always turn it into, essentially, you can always factorize it in terms of primes. So let's say 15. And by the way, in terms of primes, two some powers, right? So 15 is just five, three times five, right? But three times five to the one. And then, but the thing is that the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is defined over all primes. So actually, this equation goes seven to the zero, 11 to the zero, blah, and infinity. But we mostly care about the ones that obviously have non-zero exponents. And obviously, they're never going to have you know, negative exponents. Um, this will come in handy later when we see B smooth numbers. Um, but I'll get that, to that soon. So essentially, um, now let's talk about uh, finite fields in the integers, which is where we're going to start with our asymmetric cryptography. And we're going to get there really soon. Um, by the way, am I over time? Oh, very soon. OK, not yet. Not yet. Awesome. So we have essentially for some, what's it called, for some field, we denote it as ZPZ or essentially the, the set of integers over, this means set of integers modulo p. So that is that actually forms a finite field. Um, and we denote it a lot as fp. And I put a lot of effort into making this nice. Uh, I love this notation. Um, but yeah, as we saw, essentially, um, so one thing that I didn't note before, I don't know why I said it as we saw, but one thing I didn't know before is that um, essentially the set of anything modulo anything is defined up until the number before it. So in, a, in, in layman's terms, so let's say the set of x, z, uh, 5z, right? So that means all of the integers modulo 5. This set is simply 1, 2, 3, 4. Why? Because when you hit 5, you hit 0. zero. Oh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Ha. <laughs> huh. Oof, saved it there. But yeah, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but it's defined simply from 0 to m minus 1. And uh, so yeah, and we already saw that GCD of A and what's it called? If we have, uh, what's it called? Um, essentially, the GCD of an element with the, modul the modulus being 1, then we have an inverse for each element. And this is pretty cool. So for example, let's, let's, uh, let's say the rings modulo 5. Um, somebody try to give me the inverse of 2. Right? So I'll, I'll start off. So we need 2 in such a way that multiplied by another number, and then you take away the modulus, gives us 1. Yes? Is that 3? Yes, it is. So we have 2 times 3 is 6, right? And then modulo 5. Yeah, is equal to one. Because again, the, you're mostly concerned with the remainder. It's just the remainder. It's if you, you know what, like the, the way I did it in exams is I whip out the calculator, I, divide, I, I did something like um, the, the, the super easy calculator way of doing it, even for large numbers, is that you do like, let's say 1,050, sorry, 10,051 divided by 5,041. And then you're gonna get some like, you know, two point something, right? So then you ignore the decimal, and then you, you multiply it by this again, and then you do 5, 50, 41 times 2, and then there's going to be 10,005 minus this, and then you get the remainder. That's how you do it on the calculator. It's uh, super tedious. Well, I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. So you, so you, so you, so you chunk, chunk it to the decimal. Oh, I meant chunk it to the thing before the decimal. Trunky the thing before, the, how are you going to trunky the thing before the so decimal? So if you end up with 2 point something, you just subtract 2 and you multiply by the divisor. Uh, so the problem is just essentially floating point. Rounding. Rounding, so you're going to get something weird sometimes. Um, and uh, like some, some, my calculator has one that will give you the modulus like sometimes, like with just a one operation. So I try, I try to use that first. If it works, it doesn't work for large numbers. Um, now, another more math jargon is Fermat's little theorem, which is essentially for any 
essentially, not group, but you, you, you can say any set modulo some, some prime. Um, then, oh yeah, and sorry, one thing before I continue. Um, the nice thing about finite fields is because if the modulo is prime, then we know that primes only have common factors of one in itself. That's what a prime number is defined does, right? A prime number of seven only has one times seven. That's the only way you can create seven multiplicatively. So every number has an inverse, modulo five, because there is no common divisor with five. Five has no common divisor, it's prime, right? So that's, we, you, we usually care about that. Um, Fermat's little theorem tells us that essentially um, a to the power of p minus one, so the last element, is always gonna give us one for, and by the way, this is a, it's a long proof. Well, not too, too long, but it, it's, it's fairly involved. Um, if p does not divide at a, so by the way, this is not necessarily over primes, or sorry, this is over primes, but essentially this is saying any number larger than p is gonna give you, and that's multi like a multiple, a multiple of p is gonna give you zero, a to the p minus one, and then this, I, actually this one is really, really, really simple. If a is some, you, you know, if a is some qp to some power, let's say, uh, even if it's p minus one, this is always just gonna be, what's it called, zero modulo something. Because it's, a multipl it's multiplied by the thing, it has no remainder. So it's zero, it's Fermat's little theorem and it's very, it's very simple. But the part about a is p minus one is equal to one, that one's a little bit more involved. But it's, inter it's good to know and we will get to it later. And then essentially, Yes. So we're doing pseudo mathematics right now. Sorry? Oh, sure. It's a sort of pseudo mathematics because I don't want to get bogged down into every, because when I learned this, I learned a proof for every single thing. So it was, it was fun. <clears throat> it actually was fun, but I mean, it, we are li time limited. And it's 3.03. So do you guys want to stop here? Or do you want the primitive root theorem and then we go, or what? Okay, sure. So the primitive root theorem just basically means that there exists something called generator elements, and they are not every element is a generator, by the way. But that means um, essentially that there's always an element in the or or more than one. Uh, they usually call them you call them a set of uh, unit. Sorry, not, you call them a set of generators. But um, elements that raise to the power from one to p minus one give you every other element. So a number multiplied with itself will give you the whole codomain over and over again. And this is really interesting. I think, uh, I think for example, for modulo, I could be wrong, but I think for modulo nine, sorry, modulo, uh, let's say seven, I think two is a generator. So let's, let's, let's enumerate the elements. Um, so two, so two times the inverse, of course, this is gonna be some number, but I'm not gonna, it's gonna be, what's it called? It's gonna be, um, What's going to be the, the anybody want to help me with the modulo, with the inverse of 2 and 7? It's going to be 4, yes, 8, yes. So this is going to be, okay. So 2 to the 1. You, you could even start with 0, but you don't have to. But 2 to the 0 is equal to 1. 2 to the 1 is equal to 2. Uh, 2 to the 2 is equal to 4. 2 to the 3 is equal to 8, which is equal to the, to the seven, this is equal to one. Again, this is why I said we didn't, we didn't have to use it. Two to the four is 16. Sorry, it's still two. So this might not be a generator. I think it might be, there's always, there's usually one. Let's, let's try three. Three minus three, 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 two is nine, which is two, yeah. Three to the three is 27 which is a six, uh, three to the four is, anyway, I think, I think it is a generator. <laughs> Take my word for it, but it happens, they exist. Um, and we can, I just forget which one was easy. There's one w where two is a generator, but I forgot which one. I think it's maybe five, but I, you, get, you guys get the point. Um, there, are, there are generators of finite fields and this is gonna come in handy very soon. So when we're all back from lunch, um, or sorry, break, yeah, second break, then, then we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about this and probably do a problem or two.